Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I now call this uh, meeting to order. I'm going to ask uh, Reverend Mac Jackson, if he would, to uh, say a prayer for us to get started, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we come before you, we ask for your wisdom, ask for your guidance, as we do the business of this great state of Georgia, Father. We know that you're well able, and we depend on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. It is my pleasure and honor to call HB 1358 before this committee. Representative or Chairman Mary, Mandy Ballinger will come forward if you just make yourself comfortable there. For those of you in the audience today, I want to remind everyone, uh, we held two hearings on this proposed piece, uh, proposed piece of legislation. I believe one was last week and one was earlier this week. Is that correct, Madam Chair? Okay. So uh, she's going to present this bill, and then we're going to open it up for questions and comments amongst the members of this deliberative body. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I know that this, um, you know, I, I presented this bill before the subcommittee twice. We heard from the public, um, and this is really just kind of to, you know, substantiate or answer any questions, remaining questions that members of the committee might still have uh, regarding House Bill 1358. I am working from LC 393311S. Um, and the substantive portions of the bill are. Uh, I'll just kind of go through those. Um, it's kind of starts on 42 and runs until 46. Um, and it basically says any weapon or long gun, unless such person is a lawful weapons carrier, is used in this paragraph, the term weapon, long gun, and lawful weapons carrier shall have the same meanings as provided in code section 1611, 125, one. Um, and then another substantive portions you'll find on line 66 through 68, lawful weapons carrier means any license holder person who is eligible to retain a weapons carry permit and is not otherwise prohibited by law from possessing a weapon or long gun or person license to carry a weapon in any other state. Um, that really is the substance of the bill. Um, we're basically saying that anybody um, who wants to possess a weapon, carry a weapon, they don't have to have a card from the government um, to be able to exercise that right. Um, and Basically, the, the rest of it just kind of strikes um, and provides for, instead of weapons carry license, a lawful weapons carrier, which is the uh, definition that I just went over. Um, there's very little change other than that change, uh, substituting lawful weapons carrier for weapons carry license holder um, throughout the rest of the bill. I'll be more than happy to take any questions. Like I said, the substantive parts of the bill are um, line 60 with that definition changes oops, on line 66 through 68. Okay, all right. We do have a, a few questions uh, for the author. Uh, number 16, is that? Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To my friend, uh, Representative Ballinger, well, a question, and I've been asked this by my constituents. Okay. What, what about the reciprocity laws? Um, would you still need a license to carry if you are going into another state? It would depend upon the laws of that state. You would have to abide by the laws of that state. Um, I will say that 23 other states have um, what they call a permitless carrier, constitutional carry. Um, so this isn't a new idea or it's not something that's unheard of in other states. 23 uh, other states do have. Do have it. Okay. Any further questions, Representative Jackson? No. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Number nine down here. Who is that? Would you raise your hand? Representative Evans, you're recognized this time. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I wasn't in the other subcommittee, so I haven't. Uh, I just started reviewing this legislation um, uh, yesterday. So I did want to just clarify a few things sure. about this. Um, so we, we do know in Georgia, since we don't have criminal background checks and firearm sales, that there is a large market for guns such as at gun shows or through websites like arms.com. And these do not require people to get background checks. So do you agree with that? No. So what um, would be your, be your response to that? That, that, uh, that all, all guns, I mean, I'm talking about buying a gun initially, not about getting the, not about getting the permitless carry. 
Well, you, you have to have a background check to obtain a firearm from a licensed retail dealer. Um, whether or not in this bill right here, it doesn't have to do with buying or selling firearms. It only has to do with what you can and can't do with a card from the government. Um, so if you could stick to Jermaine questions, okay. I would appreciate well, I guess, it. I guess to, uh, this, I, isn't I guess, a, this isn't something, you know, kind of on firearms over general. So well, it's I, specifically the, I guess my line of makeup on chairman. Sure. Yeah. So my line of reasoning is, is that this, this background check does, um, excuse me, this, uh, concealed carry permit does provide an extra layer of protection um, for Georgians to make sure that some people aren't getting a permit. Um, I mean, aren't, aren't, aren't having a concealed carry permit. Having a concealed carry permit does carry with it some benefits. Um, one of those is ease of purchase of firearm. Um, so there are some, and a lot of people, that's why we're not doing away with the weapons carry permit. We still maintain that permit process for people who want to have, have a permit. Um, and most of those people are um, you know, people who are buying and selling guns and, and they don't want the hassle of having to go through that background check every time they want to purchase a firearm. So there are some advantages to having a permit. Right. Um, I, I do want to make sure that, I mean, do you know that last year over 5,000 people applied for a concealed carry permit and they were denied through the system because they were not eligible to own a gun? So were you aware of that statistic? No. Okay. So that to me, with, with when we get a when we do away with this uh, this concealed carry permit, that possibly there could be another five thousand people that would be uh, potentially, you know, carrying a gun. Um, that really, you know, shouldn't shouldn't have one. Um, and the the other point I would just make is that if we do pass this, and I know we're on a trajectory, unfortunately, to pass it, that we will we still have these loopholes where people can buy guns uh, to, and um, they, at, at, at these gun shows and everything. And so we just have this unfettered access to guns. And I'm very, very concerned about, about that. Um, but I would like to yeah. point out that this yeah. doesn't increase the universe. Um, it just does away with the, you know, if you wanna carry a concealed, you don't have to have a card from the government. That's all this bill does. Um, I mean, it doesn't increase the universe. It doesn't, um, you know, it's not going to stop bad people from doing bad things. If you can come up with a bill that prevents that, I'll be more than happy to be second signer on it. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, you know, our legislation, our government is not set up um, to, to police to that level. Um, if bad people are going to do bad things, unfortunately, punishment is, is our first, um, you know, our front line. Do you think that this legislation will improve safety in Georgia? Oh, I think definitely. Okay. Um, and are, are you aware that in Arizona, since they enacted permitless carry legislation in 2010, the annual rate of aggravated assaults committed with a firearm increased by 8%? And, and since Alaska enacted permitless carry law in 2003, the state has experienced a 65% increase in annual rate of aggravated assaults with a gun? Were you aware of those statistics? Um, no, I was not aware of those statistics, but uh, you know, with regards to Arizona's 8%, um, how much did the population increase over time, mm -hmm. over that time? Chair, Chair, now recognize Chairman Powell for a different perspective. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate being recognized. And I'll see if I can walk through this, if I may, and uh, to your editorializing this issue. Uh, to start with, I want to tell you the concealed weapons permit bill that is currently in effect in the state of Georgia that we passed several years ago, Ms. Ballinger, uh, Chairman Jaspers, myself, and a numerous of other people. We passed that bill because on Second Amendment's issues, we've been taking a bite out of the apple every year to try to see what works. Uh, a lot of times we hadn't been able to pass everything that should have been passed to to really ensure people's Second Amendment rights to have a weapon. But the concealed weapon permit bill that you talk about, it will remain in effect. And there's a reason for that because it's important that not every state reciprocates with the state of Georgia and those that do that still require that permit. 
So this permitting process for true Second Amendment supporters until nationwide something is done, which I hold that little little confidence about the U.S. Congress, but Second Amendment they'll be able to re uh, reciprocate with the other states that recognize Georgia. Secondly, and most importantly, one of the bills that was passed in the 90s, and I may have a little bit of knowledge of that bill because a guy by the name of Curtis Jenkins and myself passed this on the heels of the Brady Act, that if you have a Georgia concealed weapons permit and you don't have a waiting period at a licensed firearm store, which is important to a lot of folks, that they do that. So there is a purpose for that. I would like to remind the good lady that when this bill was passed, the concealed weapons permit, there was anxiety. There was threats that there would be blood in the streets. It was the most terrible thing possible. Uh, the New York times, the LA times, they put some of the legislators in Georgia's pictures on their front page and talked about how dangerous it was. But yet the blood didn't run in the streets and it was a step forward. Now we move forward to the point that uh, this governor and as is in all legislation, there's a time for all of it. We've had governors who did not believe in moving forward with it. So because of that in the legislative process, we didn't move forward. It wasn't a matter that, uh, that permitless carry wasn't an issue. It was a matter we couldn't pass it at the time, but now we can because we have a governor who recognizes the, the necessity and the rights of all people to a rights. So there's a lot of, everybody's got their own opinions. Uh, bad people do bad things. There's no perfect uh, solution to anything in our society, but you know, there's not enough police officers uh, our people that in public safety, they can't get to a lot of the episodes that happen case in point for the folks that live in the metro area. It would be a good thing if you have your own weapon, but I will continue to say people have a responsibility. They need to know what deadly force is. They need to know how to use a weapon, but there is nothing that is better in the case of an active shooter or a criminal taking advantage of somebody than a law-abiding citizen that has a weapon and knows how to use it. So that's my editorial back to your editorial. Chair, I recognize uh, Chairman Jaspers now. <clears throat> this is not an editorial. <laughs> this is a, a question to the bill sponsor. Okay, under your legislation, Chairman Ballinger, if a lady who is not pro otherwise prohibited from carrying a weapon with a sudden threat to her life the night before, if she's comfortable with it, be able to more quickly able to arm herself under your legislation if she chooses to and protect herself. Yes, actually a, a colleague of mine in Tennessee um, passed a bill that um, uh, did away with the wait time on a concealed carry permit if the lady had filed a temporary protective order, um, knowing the lethality and domestic violence situations. Um, you know, a lot of people say, why do you carry a Glock? And the answer is, well, it's lighter than, <laughs> than a policeman. Um, so certainly it enables um, someone who wishes to do so um, to take uh, responsibility for their own public, their own public safety. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Chairman Petrie at this time. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, uh, Chairman Ballinger, so um, just a couple of things to point out. Um, uh, first of all, uh, to the comment about uh, people buying guns without a uh, criminal record check, that, that, that doesn't happen if they're legally purchasing firearms. And this body dealt, I carried a bill three years ago, we dealt with the issue of people getting guns illegally, felons getting guns, and increased penalties for that. Um, I just wanted to mention that, but is it not true that this bill has nothing to do with how people acquire guns? It simply uh, is focused on making sure that people have a right to carry them when in fact, um, uh, by definition, criminals are carrying weapons concealed anyway. And this bill would ensure that law abiding citizens have a right to, as long as they have nothing that would encumber their ability to carry a weapon, have this, the right to do so. Correct. That is correct. Chairman Petrie. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Chair, recognize uh, Representative Clark. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just along some of the lines that uh, Chairman Petrie mentioned, I know earlier it was mentioned about um, gun show loopholes, and that's just a widely held misconception because mm -hmm. everybody that is dealing firearms at a gun show is a licensed registered dealer. And any licensed dealer has to run a background check on an individual before they sell a firearm. Isn't that correct? It's or my understanding it, correct. Or if they have a, li a weapons carry license, that proves that they have a one already on file and it expedites that purchase. Is that correct? That is. So the gun show loophole is a widely held misconception in, in the public. Is that correct? As are a lot of misconceptions with regards to firearms. This bill also, it doesn't expand who can carry or where they can carry. That's correct. It just simply says if you are if you meet the qualifications that this state has laid out for you to carry a firearm legally, that you can carry it without having to ask the state permission to do so. That is correct. And then f final question. Over the COVID period, we've in this state, we've had an issue with judges and the courts getting through the the applications in a timely manner for people to get their license. Is that correct? I believe there were some instances when probate court suffered a backlog because the courthouse had been closed due to COVID. So would you agree that a, that a court that is unable to timely process that application is in fact an infringement upon the Second Amendment rights to carry, to, to have a, to have a firearm? The guarantee that our Second Amendment has that then the, that they not process them not processing those applications does infringe upon that right. It does prevent people from carrying concealed whenever they are insured that right by the Second Amendment. Okay, thank you. Okay, Rep Representative Evans, you have a final question there. I wanted to ask the chairwoman: Is that if if this bill passes, would you be open to some type of different legislation that would ask that gun owners undergo training, firearms training? So that, that they, so that they know how to use their weapon? There are a lot of firearms courses. The NRA offers firearms courses. Um, many of our gun ranges offer uh, safety courses and firearms courses and you know, how to improve your, your, um, uh, your shot. Um, so you know, there are a lot of courses already out there for those that are interested. Um, you know, I, I myself go clay shooting. Um, it's really fun. Um, so, you know, people are, those courses are already available. I think making a requirement for an exercise of a fundamental constitutional right is wrong. You know, we don't require journalism degree for freedom of speech. Uh, we don't require divinity degrees uh, for freedom of religion. Why should we require a class to exercise the Second Amendment right? And, and I'll just say that those are not lethal. These are, you know, a gun is a lethal weapon. And so I do feel like there should be a higher standard. Okay. Uh, we'll recognize the governor's floor leader, Representative Lott. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for bringing this legislation. Um, I have just a question, and it, it falls in line a little bit with Representative Evans' comments. Um, and she made the comment about an increase in aggravated assaults. Um, and even in recent conversations, I attend to regularly, if I get into these conversations, it's usually for some reason, it's a man telling me I don't need a weapon. <laughs> so let's start with, I've got a little bit of an issue with that at 130 pounds. They got me. Mm -hmm. That's it. Um, so <laughs> said he doesn't count on it. But um, I think my question for you in relationship to that is um, in your research, have you not found that women tend to have, um, well, I, I will say this, in those places where we are not allowed to carry, have you found in your research that there may be an increase in domestic violence, in rapes, in some of the things that we can't defend ourselves as easily with? Is there any is there any background on that that you know of? There isn't with regards to um, the lethality in a woman possessing or not possessing a firearm. Um, you know, there's just no there's no uh, research on that. Um, having worked in the domestic violence arena for quite some time, you know, there's not any research to kind of compare those apples to oranges. However, I will say that, um, you know, 
uh, God did create man and woman, but it took Smith and Wesson to make them equal. <laughs> so, um, you know, some people can say that, you know, there's no way that a woman is ever going to physically be able to overpower, uh, you know, uh, some people, but, you know, a firearm would certainly ensure her public safety. Thank you. At this time, I'll uh, recognize Chairman Powell for a motion. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I'd, move, I'd, move, I'd move that this House uh, do pass HB 1358, LC 393321S as a committee substitute, and I make that a motion. Does the chair hear a second? Second. There is a second uh, to, to pass HB 1358 LC 393321S as a substitute. All I'm, those in favor, sorry, please say aye. Correction, Mr. Sorry. Chair, I do apologize. Um, I have LC 393311S. Is, is, oh, that is? Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. So the 21 is the most, okay. Yes, I do correct. apologize. I was working from an older version. I have 17 versions of this bill running around my office and I just picked up the wrong one. So I do apologize Thank you, um, on the correct so, LC number. So the posture of the committee now is just, there was a motion made and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. The ayes clearly have it and this bill will go on to rules. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Thank members you. of the committee. Appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Now here, uh, House Bill 1378, Chairman Jaspers, if you want to go down to the table or podium. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I have the uh, original 1378. It's not been amended. So there's not a sub. It's 393256. Yes. Wait. Okay. Um, you know, firstly, it, it, as I mentioned the other day, um, you know, when you get involved in th these bills, you have a lot of people that support you. And I today I have one of my constituents here. And uh, it's Jeff Anderson lives up above me. You can hear me when I'm chasing my kids or my dog in my yard. And and I'll tell you just a quick story, not to burn time, but, you know, when I first started this, he helped me cut watermelon on the first time that I was on July 4th in Calhoun at the county fair to get elected. And I appreciate him. And he's been a great stalwart supporter of mine on Second Amendment issues. And I just appreciate Mr. Anderson. You don't get much more grassroots than that. You don't. And I, we all should thank those that help us. Amen. So in the bill, you know, this is a, a, something that we have all seen. You look at House Bill 218, it went over, we passed it with the Senate. They added a few things that came back. We, you know, passed, agreed, disagreed. We stripped it down to just the um, uh, reciprocity language. Generally, that's what's in here, except for the first part. This comes back to uh, part of the bill that, um, that we have all seen. If you've been on a committee, it's the church and the change in what churches are we're moving them to private property that's what the strikeout does and that's all it does and you know thought of making just a little story about what it means you know the first time we really debated this this was you know currently a large church got money they can afford to hire security and prohibit everyone else in the church from having a weapon small church well, they can't afford it. And in doing so, they have to allow everyone to carry and to, to have their own security within the building. And what this change does is allow them to do as they wish. If they want to prohibit people and designate a security team, they can. If they want to let everybody carry, they can. That's what private property is. And, uh, and I think it's very important to go and let them do as they choose, you know, state of Georgia is very diverse across the state. And this will put everybody on the same playing field and, you know, and they'll be treated as common trespass. In section two, 
This is request is due to COVID closures and whatever the future may bring. It will allow the online application, the renewal and accept renewal by mail by our probate judges. You know, as we know now, you know, they, when your renewals come through, they have to run your background check. You don't have to get new fingerprints. Um, this makes it very easy for them to do that. We'd love to allow them to do that, but it also prohibits a database. This database is sometimes in a good thought, you know, there's a good intention that they may want to just remind the member, you know, the, the license holder, permit holder, that it's, you know, five years from now. But we do not want databases that are out there for be hacked or, or used to track down people who have a, a weapon or weapons license. There has to be a penalty to do this. You see that in the bill because some will do it and we need to prohibit it. In section three, you know, governor, you know, governments acquire many weapons over the year. This section requires the sale of these unclaimed weapons once every 12 months when five or more are accumulated and in possession of the county. Again, there's a trigger to force them to sell. In section four, under the declared state of emergency, firearms, ammunition, reloading supplies cannot be seized. Also, the prohibition manufacturing sale during or prior to a declared state of emergency. Also, we'll close, they cannot close or limit the hours of being open unless all businesses are closed. Also on ranges, you know, where we talked about training just a moment ago, where all businesses are closed. And in section five, it's just the, just a refers back in emergency powers and another code section to the emergency powers language. Mr. Chairman, that's where our bill is. And I'll be glad to answer the committee's questions. Any questions for members of this committee? Any comments from members of this committee? 27, Chairman Powell. Thank you. I want to thank my good friend for bringing this bill forward. Well thought out. Um, I would like to ask a question, and this may or may not be the best time. We can certainly add to a little something into here. But on uh, section four, dealing with government seizure during a state of an emergency, it had been brought to me by some other people who had concerns uh, in the definition section where we, uh, on line 29, that a weapon shall have the same meaning as set, set forth in code section 16-1-125.1, that that deals only with firearms. And some of the folks who have concerns that we have a broader code section that would define knives or clubs or those things. Um, I would ask, uh, do we want to send to the, to the author, do we want to send this bill out clean as introduced, or would this be a time to add this to it, or we can add to it at any point, because uh, we know once it gets over to the Senate, this thing can come back looking like a Christmas tree, and then we wind up... Uh, go into conference committee, we could put it in then, or we can put it in now at the wishes of the author of the bill. And I'll leave that up to you. Well, Chairman Powell in 1611-127.1 uh, is a much broader definition of weapon. This probably has 25 different things in that code section right. that describe a weapon. And I wouldn't be opposed to doing it right now. All right, then I'll make that motion at the proper time. And thank you again. And since you certainly had a chance to recognize your constituent, that old gentleman is wearing a blue sport coat and the got the white beard that looks like Santa Claus. He is absolutely the most important person in this room to me because he's the only one that can vote for me. In this room. <laughs> but he is a certified gun trainer, a firearms expert, and absolutely one of the finest people I know from Livonia, Georgia. And I'd like to welcome you, Mike. Okay, Chair, recognize uh, Representative Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman uh, Jasper, just want to be clear on the church uh, section that you said and uh, understand so I can explain to my constituents what we need to do. Yeah. Um, you said it become private property, a church now. So do we need to put the signs up prohibiting guns or? What, do, what, is, what does the church change? How does it change with the church? Well, they can put a sign up mm -hmm. 
representative. And but it's going to be up to the church to enforce their internal policy. You know, the sign it can be violated. It's not going to prevent you from walking in, but they have to enforce it and and ask them to leave. If they don't, they're certainly welcome at that moment to call law enforcement and have them charged with trespass. Okay. Yes. Any Thank other you. questions? Yeah. Representative Clark. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Quick question uh, to my friend. In section two on lines uh, 96 through 98 and also 111 and 112, if I'm reading this correctly, if a city or any political subdivision of the state or any political subdivision, if, if they fail to comply to um, auctioning off firearms uh, in, a, in the timely manner that's laid out in this bill, that in those lines, it says a prevailing plaintiff in such action shall be entitled to his or her cost. So that that means any fees that they that they get that the that they're going to so a city does not comply with this, they're going to have to reimburse the plaintiff in that case. Yes, sir. OK, thank you. Chairman Petrie. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Chairman Jasper, uh, Section 3, and, and, I'm, and I apologize for asking the question now. I wasn't on the subcommittee that vetted this bill. Um, section 3, can you explain that a little more fully? Because I have a situation in, in my hometown where um, uh, they have chosen to retain these firearms uh, rather than to sell them. So I want you to explain very clearly what this does. Well, I think the simple answer yeah, they've, is... They've chosen that path. If they've chosen that path, if this is passed and signed by the governor, they'll have to sell them. They'll have to be, auction them off. And I, you know, and I think the neat thing that it has to go through a licensed firearm dealer. No, They're I, not I just going to have that. an auction and anybody can buy them. You know, okay. the the firearms dealer they'll have to, as you asked a moment ago, with a with the permit, they can pick it up immediately. If they if the dealer all that, but it's just puts them in the road. They've got to do it. And if they don't. Mr. Chairman, you can uh, have an opportunity to force them to do yeah, so. Yeah, and, and again, so I understand, and I understand well, those guns will be sold to law-abiding citizens. I've always yeah. made that clear. That's my, my concern is it would be contrary to what my community is doing right now and what they choose to do. So, yes, it so would. to be clear, it would require them to sell those weapons. Absolutely. Okay. Would you be, would you be willing to consider removing section three from this bill no sir i would not you would I'll not oppose it okay okay thank you. Uh, representative evans thank you chairman then um thank you mr chairman um so in my in our community in the decatur community we've had some guns to gardens where people turn in their guns and they make like public art for gardens um, out of them. And uh, if the municipality wanted to do something like that with their guns, that would be, that will be illegal under this law. Yes, ma'am. They would need to sell them. Now the individual can donate it to that organization as they choose. There would be no prohibition against so, that. So an, so an individual could donate to the city for that, but if a weapon was taken by the municipality from a criminal, then, then they could not the municipality could not donate the gun for that purpose. Yes, ma'am, that's right. Any further discussion at this time? Okay. What would be the desire of this committee? There's, uh, there's, there's a move, move, move to uh, do pass. Is there a second? Second. Second. Twenty nine from code section sixteen eleven one twenty five one to sixteen eleven one twenty seven point one. To be sure if that would be proper because that second code section just expands the definition of weapons. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Then that will be my motion that we amend 
we amend the uh, House Bill 1378 in the form of a committee substitute by changing on the end of line 129, the code section strike uh, the present code section and replace it with 16-11-12701. Okay. You're making that in the form of a motion to as an amendment. To amend. And four liter lot seconds that uh, amendment. Okay. I need a second on the, the, uh, the You seconded the, the representative Mathis seconded the, the uh, do pass. So I need a, a, a vote on the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. Amendment is uh, tacked on. Okay. There was a motion made by Representative uh, Clark, seconded by Representative Mathis, uh, do pass as amended. In this committee, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those aye. opposed. Okay, the house clearly had it. Thank you, Chairman. Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Committee. While we're taking uh, points of personal privilege to recognize those folks in the room, I want to recognize James Camp here. Uh, he's with the two A group, Georgia two uh, A, and he has uh, always advocated for yes. uh, Second Amendment rights here in our uh, our state, most specifically in my district. So I appreciate you being here with us today. Thank you. We've got a couple couple of more bills uh, before us today. Uh, one has not been heard in subcommittee and uh, we're gonna have a little testimony on that if, if, if need be, but uh, we're gonna move to House Bill 1455. House Bill 1455 by Colonel Hitchens. If you wanna go down to the uh, to the desk and present there for us. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I hope this one's a little easier than the last one I was here for. Yeah, before, before you continue, I just want to say that uh, this bill came up pretty quick and we wanted to, uh, to have it as soon as possible because it is a very important piece of legislation. So uh, we're going to just go dive right into it. Well, as many of you know, I, uh, I represent the Port of Savannah. The overwhelming majority of the container port is, is in my district. And the growth uh, over the last 15 or 20 years has just been off the charts. And uh, as a result, uh, there's not enough geographic area within the port itself to house all the uh, containers and all the equipment and all the things that the port requires. So what we're asking here is that the Georgia Port Authority Police, who are all certified police officers, have the authority when they transit back and forth to the facilities that they purchased so that they can check on the equipment and the property there and take action as needed, have the same powers in that jurisdiction that they're in as they have on the Port Authority. Basically, that's a, that's a synopsis of, I have letters here from the adjoining uh, jurisdictions they're all in favor of it, and uh, they, they have good working relationships. Uh, the traffic in and out of the ports, particularly with tractor trailers, is just astonishing, and they have traffic jams, and the local authorities appreciate the port police coming out and assisting with traffic direction and, in, in rare instances, uh, doing action reports. So it's uh, everybody's on board with this, and uh, they had the state of the port address the other day. They predicted the port's going to grow another 60% in the next five to 10 years. So this is going to be ongoing. That's, that's wonderful. It's a good problem to have. It's good for our area. That's My right. district's the third fastest growing district in the state. Uh, is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak to this bill? Okay. Any questions from the author of the bill at this time? If not, the chair would entertain a motion. Move do pass. Move do pass. Is there a second? Second. Second. In favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay. Your bill passes. Thank you, Colonel. And our last bill that we're going to hear uh, today is going to be House Bill 830. My Representative Irwin, if you'll come forward at this time, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I didn't know there was going to be an all-star cast with all-star bills uh, before mine here, but you thank you for the opportunity. You're here in the Public Safety Committee, and we're just like the love boat. There's always something exciting and new here before this committee. 
Yeah, yes, it is. Right. Go ahead. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and representatives. Uh, today, I bring before, before you House Bill 830, which updates our general law concerning the minimum salary of our elected sheriffs. If you look at the uh, second page of the bill, it's two pages, uh, or excuse me, the bottom of the first page, you're seeing we are changing one line there in, in this bill 830, and it is... Uh, um, you know, that the sheriffs will serve more than one court, as you can see previously, that is what their minimum salary was based on, uh, serving of only one court. We elect our sheriffs um, and our state laws determine their mandates and responsibilities, which are many. Uh, sheriff's minimum salaries are determined by county population, years of service as an elected sheriff, state mandated COLAs, and one state mandated supplement for serving one court in addition to the superior court. As you know, sheriffs are officers of the court and must provide court security, serve civil papers, execute warrants, return prisoners, and perform other court services as needed. Sheriffs devote a considerable amount of staff resources and personal time serving our courts, House Bill 830 seeks to authorize minimum salary supplements for each additional court served as are presently authorized for our clerks of superior court. Our current law establishes uh, the supplement to be $385.90 per month for each court served. Since sheriffs presently receive a supplement for one court in addition to Superior Court under House Bill 830, most sheriffs will qualify for up to three additional courts served. The minimum salary of our elected sheriffs should be increased considering the immense degree of responsibility and liability they assume as a result of the will of past and present legis legislation and governors. Um, I'm specifically talking there about the accountability courts as well as uh, the, the other duties that we have uh, put on our sheriffs. I would think you would agree with me. Our sheriffs are very important to us. They do a very good job for this state. Uh, they work very hard, and I feel personally they should be compensated for that, uh, not just one court, but all courts that they serve. I do have some data, um, but, I, you know, in, in time here, I'll hold off unless questions come where I can provide that data as needed, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, at, at this time, I do want to hear, we, we did have testimony in subcommittee and and uh, it was been brought to my attention that uh, ACCG does take a position on this. So uh, for the for the benefit of all the members of the committee, I'm going to ask if they'd come forward at this time and state their state their opinion. You know, sometimes we can't please everybody, mm -hmm. and that's why we have members of this committee to make these hard decisions. So if you would please just state your name and who you with. My name is Gabriel Carter. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for this opportunity and fellow committee members. I've been able to speak to uh, quite a few of you today, and uh, I know this is an extremely challenging issue, but I appreciate the opportunity to speak a little bit on it. Um, we, we believe that this conversation cannot be discussed in isolation. We believe that when talking about the share of salary, there's an entire conversation that needs to be had. So there's only three things that we want to make sure that you are considering when voting on this bill. The first is that the General Assembly over the years has actually enacted legislation and done things to increase the salaries of sheriffs. So in 2019, their base salary was increased uh, through SB 171. In 2020, they received a COLA, cost of living adjustment. In, tw uh, in this uh, current budget, FY22, FY23, 2023, the governor's $5,000 uh, increase for state employees would also go to the sheriffs. And then there's also uh, longevity payments, 5% for each term served. So this isn't just a matter of, of one uh, couple thousand dollars that, that are coming to sheriffs. There's a lot of things that go into sheriff's salary. The second thing is that a lot of counties, we, we appreciate our sheriffs and we wanna do everything possible to know that they're 
let them know that they're appreciated. So a lot of our counties outside of state mandates do local supplements, which are completely voluntary. A lot of them try to make sure that they are giving that in addition to what the state mandates that their salaries are. And the third thing we want you to consider with this bill, to try to make this simple, sheriffs can serve on a total of six courts. They already serve on, they already serve the Superior Court. That's a part of their just standard duty. They are able right now in law to serve on one additional court for an extra uh, supplement of $4,000, $4,600. That leaves four additional courts that they can serve on. So even if they just serve on three additional courts with this bill, that's 12,000, that's over $12,000 that will be gone to, in, to increase their salaries. So when thinking about that number, I want you to think about the small rural counties and what a $12,000 increase can do to someone's salary and the burden that that may place on a small rural county's budget. So in, in closing, I, I promise the chairman that I wouldn't take too long, but in closing, we want you to know that we appreciate, we are deeply appreciative and immensely grace, grateful for the work that our sheriffs do. We know it's not easy. We know they put their lives in line every day and we know that they work to keep our community safe. But this bill puts us in a challenging position as counties because we have to look at our county budget and say, how do we figure out how we can compensate everyone adequately, but also provide quality county services? And sometimes that means saying no to really hard things. So we're asking you all to, to join us in saying no to something that's really challenging, I know for all of you all, uh, and, and oppose this bill, because we believe that when the state comes and mandates uh, what county funds are, are going to, it impedes our ability to provide those quality uh, county services. So we're asking you to uh, oppose this bill with us, and uh, I'll say for any questions if there are any. I, I do take one exception to, to one of the things you said. Not every county across this state will have those four additional courts. I mean, is that is that right? Yeah, so not every county has a recorder's court, but every county has a probate court, every county has a juvenile court, and some of the magistrate courts are with uh, the probate courts, but that's, that's far and few between. So each county would have, an, at a minimum, most counties would have, at a minimum, three additional courts that would, that would fall into okay. this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Floor Leader Lott, you have a question or comment? I do. I have a kind of probably a simple question you may have said this so i apologize um and thank you mr chairman for recognizing me um are they mandated to serve on the courts if they are requested are the sh are the sheriffs mandated to say yes required to say yes if they are requested to serve the court I, to be frank with you i'm not sure that they are are mandated they are asked if they are asked i i know a lot of uh the, the sheriffs do um, do uh, serve in that role, but I'm not sure that they're that they're mandated if they are asked. But uh, again, to try to answer the the complete question, um, we know it's a challenge to say to ask them to serve on the court and, and not get that additional supplement for it. But we try to make up for that in a lot of different ways. So, additional question. If you Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, and so, what do courts who don't use the sheriff do? How do they provide? Uh, enforcement. What do they do? That's a question I don't have the answer to. Maybe uh, Tara can, can speak on that. But we'll let uh, come, come on, come on up, Sheriff Norris. Come on. You've elevated me. Um, I think the answer, the short answer to that is, if if the sheriffs did not serve these courts, who would? And that's your question. And, if and how the, much would it cost? It, well, the state court, for instance, in Muskogee County, that part of his budget is a quarter of a million a year just for that state court. I do know that. But, but the point I wanted to make is this. If the sheriff wasn't doing it, then it would probably fall on the county governing authorities to fund somebody that does. Now, nobody else can really do it unless there's a county police. A lot of times, though, in a, a state court, you'll see a county marshal that does it because that court, a marshal was hired by, paid by the county governing authority for that particular court. There is legislation that lets that occur. That doesn't happen in a lot of cases, but it happens in some. Your Metro Atlanta case uh, counties, Fulton, DeKalb, I don't think Burnett, but they have marshal services that handle that court. Okay. And can I, may I just ask? Yes, ma'am, go right so here. So I do have a fear. Um, Mr. Carter, that uh, 
if we don't incentivize our sheriffs to do this job, I, I have a concern as to who is going to do the job, what it will cost the counties. And this probably is just a question for you to maybe look into as well as we move along in this process. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you for that question. I'll definitely try to see if I could get some, some clarity on providing you a, a, a adequate answer with that. And I guess I'll just say briefly in, in response to that question, um, we believe that through the actions taken it through the General Assembly over the years, through actions that county takes through local supplements and, and various means that we try to compensate, even if it's not directly, try to compensate the sheriffs for all of the work that they do. Okay, Chairman Powell at this time. Thank you. Um, question, since you, you're pretty versed in this, and I thank my friends of the ACCG, um, can you tell me how many of these supplements that the probate judges um, in there, they have a minimum salary as act also. Can you tell me how many uh, extra courts or extra duties that they get uh, compensation for? For the, the probate court? For the probate judges. judges. Yeah, uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm not very well versed in, in, in the, the probate court judges. And I know the clerks get something as well. Uh, I've been really just kind of focusing on, on the sheriff. I'm sorry, I don't have to right. answer back to work. The point I'm making you. is this has been a common practice yeah. that a lot of these constitutional officers, granted, a lot of them are overpaid based on what they do. But you have probate judges, and there's been a period of years that there's been other supplemental issues made to their salary for doing certain things. The same with the clerks of the court, the same with magistrates. And if I'm not sure, maybe you could answer it, or maybe my good friend, Representative Irwin, but even with this boost for the sheriffs that are doing extra court activity, if I'm not sure, this still probably wouldn't bring any of the sheriffs nowhere near what hired superintendents make today. <laughs> and they're not elected. I, I would, uh, represent I mean, Kyle, and I'm not uh, saying like that. to defer away from that for a moment, please. I mean, and I'm not saying that as a slam to you, my friend, but I, what a point I want to make to this is these folks are elected. These folks are elected and they, the sheriffs of the County are the chief law enforcement officers of the County. And I would like to, you know, that's my point that I want to make. It happens when other uh, constitutional officers it sure and it does. happens to hired people, sure uh, the bureaucrats. And in a lot of cases, the bureaucrats are making way more than the people who put their name on the ballot and run. That's a very good point there. Thank All right. You. We'll, uh, we'll recognize, uh, no, is that, uh, chairman Taylor? <laughs> yes, That's sir. You. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, just a quick question uh, uh, about the illustration that you've given to us. Yes. The base salary is the 70,000 for all sheriffs. No, it's not. It's, it's based on population. So that, for this number, it was okay. about between a population of 20,000 to about 28,000. Okay, that, that's what I wanted to check because that didn't look quite right to me. And when you calculate the 5%, do you calculate it off that base salary only? So for the longevity payment, it's 5% for each term. For each term, each yes. four-year term. Yes. Okay. I love my sheriff. All right. Okay. Uh, number eight, is that Representative Frazier? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Please go ahead. Um, my question might be for you, Mr. Carter. It might be for Mr. Norris, uh, whoever might have the stats. Um, I represent small counties. And so can you just give me um, a guesstimate of, uh, just for example, I just inherited Jenkins County. Uh, uh, the population there and the sheriff salary with this increase $5,000 and possibly if this legislation passed fees now for the increase for the courts, what would his or her salary be? So I, I don't know the, the salary. I don't, I don't know the exact population, but what I'll say in, re, in response to that is what we're, what we're seeing with this is there's a lot of 7,000, about 7,000. I have to go back and look. There's a list of, of, of salaries for each one. There's about you know, 12, 13. So I can try to get, get that specific bracket to you. But, but the challenge is that for a lot of these, these counties, we're, we're fine when it comes to percentages because that's relative, right? Smaller counties get a little bit less with a percentage. But when you have these, these concrete numbers like $5,000 from the governor's budget or $4,600 for each additional court, now that's not taking into consideration the size of the county at all. And that's part of the issue for us because if you do have a smaller county, 
it does matter that there's a $5,000 increase to the, to the sheriff's salary or a $4,000 increase for each additional court. Now we're not talking about percentages and relative amounts to the size of the county. Now we're talking about concrete numbers that doesn't take into respect the size of the county in their budget. So I hope I can try to get you a more specific answer when regard to your specific county, but you know, try, trying to give some perspective to your question. Okay. All right. At this time, the chair will submit to the will of the committee. There's a motion made and seconded to do pass uh, House Bill 830 LC 471072. Is that the yes, sir. number? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. All those opposed? Okay. Eyes clearly have it. You're on the rules. Thank you very much for being here with us. This concludes the business of this committee today. We stand adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you want to give Ms. Frazier your number? I saw you work the number up for Jenkins County. I think that they, sir, that'll be something. Sir, do I know? No, sir. Sorry. Okay.